So, boys, what do you reckon? Good or bad for Lion Town? For Lion Town, I think it's a great outcome. I've been reading a lot of commentary from Lion Town shareholders saying they want it higher, and of course you always want higher, right? But there's a lot of risk still to come, you know. They blown out on the funding side, I think, four times already. There's still a bit of a funding gap. They are, you know, nowhere near producing. Bald Hill. Yeah, and there's a lot on the line here between us as well. JD's looking like he's won a cart, and I knew, <laughs> yeah. I, should, I, knew I made the wrong bet. As we were repping for the episode, Straight Talk article has dropped, confirming who the buyer is. Right, yeah, boys. I'm not sure it's confirmed, but they've speculated. Oh, it's yeah. a rumour. Yeah. God, you'd have to be pretty bloody uh, certain to <laughs> chuck his mug on the AFR, because if you got it wrong, he'd be coming at you. <laughs> Leo, lithium. Talk about they've pretty much lost a nut today. Uh, they're down 50%. Righto, Money Miners, 4th of September, Monday, bringing you the bloody sensational mining news that we have found today. And fuck me, there's a bit going on, boys. Jeez, I learned something good off the wisdom of Travis Ricciardo <laughs> today. I was like thinking, why has it been a bit quiet on the MA front? Travis. Yeah. Firstly, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm rejuvenated. It's a Monday. Good stuff. Now, you informed me about, like, there's a bit of an end of fine, uh, annual reporting season blackout period for companies or yeah. something along that lines. Yeah, you, you, you typically won't get a, a deal announced until companies roll out their, um, their half-year results or, or end of full-year yeah. results, depending on their reporting cycle. Um, what happens is people rinse through the new numbers in their latest model and then you look to announce a deal sort of subsequent to that and see if there's any 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 changes in value off the back of those. So you're saying <laughs> from today forward, it's all going to be happening? Maybe. Yeah, hopefully. I, well, yeah, I think you there there is a degree of cyclicality in the times of year that you see deals and um, and once those results rinse through, you see more. We've got two to talk about today already. So, bloody mate, your theory is proven correct. JD, <laughs> I've, I've, I've got to say I just disagree with that. I think we've been so hot on deals. A couple of weeks ago we were speaking about SQM coming in for Yeah, Azure. but it didn't even happen. <laughs> they said no. <laughs> and then, what, about a month ago we spoke about Develop and Essential. Last week obviously it wasn't a deal, but we were chatting about Bold Hill. It's all go this year. I want two a day, <laughs> minimum. <laughs> to keep the money more right, happy. Right. But you know in 2020 there were like no deals. Like all you could talk about was equity raisings. Mm. There were literally no deals. We wouldn't but. have survived. <laughs> wouldn't have survived. JD, mate, uh, you're going all good, I assume. I'm doing well, I've been well, talking mate. to How you are all you? morning. I'm, I'm bloody sensational, mate. I want to get into this. Let's hey, do it. what have we got coming up? So we've got obviously Lion Town, have to talk about that one. Leo Lithium, out of trading halt or suspension as yeah. well. Bold Hill, got more news on that one. Argosy and a little bit of news on Hastings. Mm, very so good time. Strong lithium focus today. Right. Before we get into it, our great bloody partners at Top Drill, owner of the best shed in exploration <laughs> drilling, I think. That is a bloody sensational <laughs> shed at Kalgoorlie. Thanks to the toppies, Angela and uh, Timmy, for supporting the show. Check them out, drilling into the future. That shed looks like it uses half of the electricity in Kalgoorlie. It was that bright the day we were there. It was lit up. Oh, oh mate, oh, I'm assuming there's probably 50 solar panels on top, <laughs> so it's all uh, all net zero. Word on the decline. <laughs> <laughs> Righto, boys, let's get into it. Line Town, they've, the bid, next bid has finally come from Albemarle. Uh, we did... We, it was been sitting dormant a while since Albemarle put their last bid in that was rejected at two dollars fifty. Lion Town for those who the last bid that we heard about my, money miners that don't know Lion Town has the Kathleen Valley Lithium Project, which is the next big and upcoming underground lithium project in Australia. So Albemarle have chucked a three dollar bid at them, and apparently they put a bid in on Friday that Lion Town weren't impressed with, and then come back on. Sunday, yeah. So with some of the reports, three dollars. It sounded like it needed to have a bloody three in the front. Yeah, I mean, some of the reports that we'd read indicated this was the sixth bid, and there was three covering late last year and earlier this year at two twenty, two thirty five, two fifty. They were reported. Some of them reported a few months after the fact. But yeah, it seems like there's been another couple in between as well. So sixth bid from Albemarle, just Albemarle. I assume so. It didn't say that specifically. Yeah. Mm. The, the, big, um, the big news in relation to this one, though, Maddie, is that it's best and final from Albemarle. And, and as a result, the board of Liontown is actually recommending 
the offer, you know, sub- subject to, of course, it converting into a, a binding bid. And that happens when the due diligence process is, um, is confirmatory in, in nature and then also subject to there being no higher offer. So, so you know, you can think of the board of, of Liontown who've been pretty resistant to, to doing a deal at, at previous prices. They're now on board and, and saying they're going to re- recommend it um, subject to this DD process. Al- Almar's finally won them over, hey? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is this a bit of a um, deja vu, you'd say, Ricciardo, Ricardinho? Yeah, I, well, I think this development basically means that Liontown is now, it's up for sale, right? Um, so any other suitors, you know, if they exist... At, at, at this price, they'll be forced to show their hand now. Albemarle going best and final. Um, it's fascinating to me. Like in, in doing so, they've basically, um, you know, I think they've forced Liontown's hand to, to recommend it. Um, and it, Albemarle going best and final, it shows that they're either, they're either sure that no one else is going to come in at this price or if someone else does show up, they're happy for it to be sold to them at a higher price. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of BHP's strategy in relation to Oz Minerals, which was just last year. Um, after BHP came in with their $25 per share bid um, in August 2022, that one was reported in the media, but after, after that, and they, they weren't allowed in to do DD at that point, um, BHP went quiet for three months. You know, nothing was nothing was heard. The whole process um, is very similar, isn't it? Yeah, and then BHP returned with the best and final offer in November, which basically warranted you know Oz Minerals to, to let them in the door um, for for due, due, due diligence at that point. And I think when you have that period of time and no one else rocks up, it just provides a degree of confidence that you know you're, you're bidding against yourself when you don't have to have a, a massive uplift to to get the board recommendation and the, the best and final sort of forces the recommendation at that price. And well, in, in what, that what scenario... The, what would what did BHP pay? Was it 28 bucks? Yeah, so in that, that scenario, they came yeah. at, at, I think, a bit over 15% higher from yeah. the last bid. And in, in this scenario, from the last bid that we've heard about, they've come in 20% higher from yeah, just, 250 to three bucks yeah if it was 30 bucks you just move the decimal place back so yeah it's um so in that case it was 28 and a bit plus there was a dividend paid out to oz holders yeah yeah very interesting so they're and look they're not trading at three dollars they're trading at around line town they're trading at around two dollars 85 today i guess what's your read on that normally you would think okay three bucks they'll be trading at three bucks you've seen it with Romelius Musgrave. Musgrave traded at the the consideration value of the Romelius shares, and it just fluctuated with it. But this, is, they are not trading at three dollars. How do you interpret that? The way a company trades around, you know, M and A bids and etc. is a really, really interesting dynamic. Something that we're going to, you know, pry into in a future interview with our, an M and A arbitrage fund. Um, Have we lined one up? Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we have. Thank, they're in the Hooterroo chat, mate. Oh, yeah. Um, which, oh, is, yeah which is bloody yeah, wicked. I read every message. I run, yeah. <laughs> so, so the um, – the, and, I mean, sometimes, quite often when you've got a live bid, you see the share price trade above that bid because um, the market is factoring in that someone else might come in um, and also they're, they're, they're factoring in that there might be a high bid. In this case, Albemarle is literally best in the final. It's not going high for them. And what that $2.85 is telling you is the market is not expecting anyone else – to come in above that. And it's probably also pricing in a little bit of deal risk as well because this isn't a binding agreement yet. There's still some risk that um, it, it'll fail due diligence. And um, and so there's just a combination of, of the time time value of money and, and deal risk in there. And, and the question was actually posed in our Hooteroo group chat. So we should plug the group chat because it was it was um, the portfolio manager of an M and A arbitrage fund that responded to this very question put forward in Is the, the file coming chat. on. Yeah, yeah, oh, it will be. What a GC. Yeah. Uh, he says, and his response was, "Time value of money, and there's still no legally binding deal on the table. Paying three dollars now is taking all the risk and no reward. Best and final counter unlikely, so a discount is warranted." So, mate, brilliant bit of um, insight there in the Hooteroo group chat. So, mm. money miners, if you are, if you if you want to embrace the ethos of the the Hooteroo group chat, which is mutual education, get in there. So, when you say time value of money, you're saying this deal might take six months to go through, or longer. Yeah, I don't know if six months is the right right duration of time, but it'll be subject to a bunch of regulatory approvals. Issue, yeah. You know, like you can throw Ferb in in that, and Ferb Ferb you know can take like minimum two months. Um, so yeah. So, boys, what do you reckon? Good or bad for Lion Town? For Lion Town, I think it's a great outcome. Like they've they've stayed resilient. I think the number was that from the undisturbed price when they came out and announced that they'd first had a bid, which was in fact three months after the bid had come through. This is a ninety-seven percent premium. 
Jeez. So, yeah. I think, you know, $6.6 billion for a project that's still, you know, uh, over a year away from production, it's uh, it's a pretty stellar outcome. There's a, I think we'll get into it, but there's a lot of risk still to come, you know. They have blown out on a funding side, I think, four times already. There's still mm-hmm. a bit of a funding gap. They are, you know, nowhere near producing. It's uh, like an underground lithium mine is as yet like unproven in WA. So there's there's a lot of risk still to be, um, you know, factored into this price that Albemarle will be taking on. So I think it's a, a pretty great outcome for the uh, the Lion Town group. It, it, it depends who you ask because um, I've been reading a lot of commentary from Lion Town shareholders saying they want it higher, and of course you always want higher, right? People mm. get pretty attached to higher numbers. Who and doesn't? They, they anchor higher. Um, I personally like I don't have any horse in this race, but I think it's a wicked outcome for Lion Town shareholders. Um, but yeah. as you said, Tay, t- taking away the risk of the ramp up risk and 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 the production risk as well. You, there's some big physicals yeah. that they've got to meet very quickly to get this uh, get this operation rolling yeah, and we, have the mill fine tuned and to make sure the pace plant's fine tuned to backfill everything to them, feed the mill. Yeah, that fine tuning is not a joke. We spoke with nah. Dale at, at Pilbara Minerals around that and that has taken them a long time to, to get up mm. and humming, you know, and they're a, a real, you know, tier one asset in Pilgangora. They're a bit over double the market cap and they're printing cash $2.4 billion last year, FY23 profit. So just compare those two. Yeah, well, yeah. You, you think of like, and when you're talking about fine tuning, 5% recovery over uh, half a million tonnes of spodumene concentrate, that's a, f- that's a lot of cash if you're not getting it right. Yeah. Um, so that, that fine tuning is, uh, yeah, she's different, a bit different to a gold mine, isn't it? And uh, like the, so. the time taken to do the fine tuning. What this cash bid from Albemarle does, if it, you know, converts to a binding bid, is it basically eliminates Liontown shareholders from wearing any of that risk, which is um, why I think it's a, a wicked deal. They get a very healthy valuation when you just model it on a like-for-like basis with um, Pil- Pilbara Minerals' current valuation um, and, and completely sort of unexposed to the risk associated with, with ramp up, which is, you know, as we understand, we, we think it's, we think it's a real, real risk, right? Um, I've got some other interesting points, Maddie, in relation to this deal. That I'm all ears, keen, keen Ricardinho. Uh, so you read the announcement from Lion Town out and um, normally when you see these announcements, they tell you how long their due diligence period is going to be for. This one didn't actually mention a number of weeks at all. It, it basically just, um, just left that blank and said a, a defined period of time. Um, but it's pretty customary that it's a four, you know, you have about a four week due diligence period, um, for example. So uh, I'm not, not quite sure what to read into the fact that they haven't actually stated how long the DD period is agreed for. It might have something to do with the fact that their exclusivity agreement is not yet executed and um, that number might still rinse through. But I did find that intriguing. Another one that's interesting to me from this bid, um, you know, the analysts out there can actually deduce what long term lithium price. Albemarle is using internally and the brokers are pointing to Albemarle must be using a 19 US $1,900 per ton SE6 long-term lithium price in order to, to, to back solve the bid for line down here. That's a pretty informative number for all of the uh, lithium developers out there. I think Patriot, for example, who, who, who've recently had an investment from line down because now all of a sudden, you know, um, you know what price deck or long-term price price assumption Mm. Albemarle has and that um, gives you a bit of additional information when it comes to negotiating in um, any future corporate activity. I think that was a little bit higher than general consensus, correct me if I'm wrong, when we did a comp the other week when we were, I forget, were we talking about Sayona or no, there was another lithium company I think a lot were using around 1500 so I think 1900 is a bit bit higher than what we think but that's you know, it wouldn't have been nineteen hundred if they paid two bucks fifty. Yeah, I, I, well, it just goes to show the how aggressive Albemarle are in in their their bull case for lithium at the moment. I heard rumours that at the recent um, fast markets conference, most organisations there had like five people, and Albemarle had um, north of thirty people there. So, um, you know, they're, they're they're being extremely aggressive in the space as we're seeing in the in their corporate um, moves at the moment. And the last interesting point um, I had, Maddie, was it, this comes off the back of just a couple of days ago, Lion Town, like there was an announcement that Lion Town would be joining the ASX 100 index. It's a pretty staggering outcome for, a, for a, an, 
a developer to join the ASX 100 mm. index, I'd love to see a historical list of um, single asset developers that have actually made their way to the, the top 100 um, yeah. companies on you, the go, you look at Pilbara, they're a single asset, but they're a producer. Producer, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, I'd love to see. I imagine it's a very, very skinny list of um, developers. AVZ. Not even AVZ, AVZ cracked no. it. I don't think oh, they, didn't they? They made the 200, I was about yeah. to say. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, flagship asset. <laughs> <laughs> Friends of the show. Yeah, right. So interesting. Yeah, I'd say what did they they refer to them in street talk? I think that's been known before. The the line is so you've got Goiter own and Tim Goiter own and fifteen percent of Line Town. Then you've got about another twenty percent that is held by Goiter's Tim Goiter's associates and circle in and around uh, Western Australia. So the Mr Goiter and the Line is would. Uh, Absolutely rolling in cash once this goes through, even though they were already, but they will realise it. Mm. So, and Big tax bills to pay. <laughs> yeah. So th- this is um, – you probably said at the start, I miss it. All ca- it's, it's an all-cash offer. $3 cash. Yeah, yeah, $3 cash. Right. Continue on the lithium theme, and this one – sort of sparked the interest at the end of last week and we have a bit more information today. Yeah, and there's a lot on the line here between us as well. This mm, is a good one. Yeah, I know. JD is looking like he's won a cart and I knew, <laughs> I, should, I, knew I made the wrong bet. I went against my pre uh, previous bloody predictions. But Bald Hill, uh, we had there was a Singapore exchange update but then as we were prepping for the episode, a Street Talk article has dropped confirming mm. who the buyer is. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure it's confirmed, but they've speculated. Oh, it's yeah. a rumour. Yeah. God, you'd have to be pretty bloody uh, certain to <laughs> chuck his mug on the AFR because <laughs> if you got it wrong, he'd be coming at you. <laughs> yeah, so people might be wondering what we're talking about. We're talking about Bold Hill, the uh, producing lithium mine in, in Western Australia. So we spoke about last week the administrators, McGrath, Nickel, and, you know, it was sort of in and around them having done a deal on for, or for Bold Hill to really sell the asset, which is somewhat controversial you know you've got all these different players in and around and it's not entirely clear to us who has the the right necessarily to to act on the behalf of all of these things so you've got quarter mentha who are the receiver and they released a statement to the singapore exchange via alliance minerals which is alita and there was there was a few interesting details in the statement so one that stood out to me was that the receivers and managers have received in excess of 10 approaches for parties interested in acquiring Bold Hill. Mm-hmm. You know, we've, we've spoken about this, not entirely surprising. You know, you'd, you'd think a lot of the uh, significant lithium players would be interested in scooping up a asset that's already producing in Western Australia. That's very understandable, but uh, kind of interesting to see it confirmed. And then another line that stood out to me was that the deed of company arrangement, also known as the Docker, remains on foot and has not been terminated. And they went on to say that it's not capable of being terminated until a court meeting on Tuesday, September 5th. So that's tomorrow. So what I really took away is that mm. things are happening pretty soon. And like you said, we'd seen the Street Talk article that MinRes were the supposed buyers of this one. There's a few different questions that I have for this. The one I'm most interested to hear is what happens to the offtake agreement? So it had been reported a couple months back that these guys were selling spodumene concentrate at a very markdown price. You know, one of the one of the lines I'd seen around this was that it was 60% markdown from what the market value is to a Chinese buyer. And they were doing this to avoid paying the 5% uh, export tax on lithium spodumene um, concentrate. So, yeah, I mean, what, what sort of happens to it is the agreement between the, the parties kind of like uh, a royalty in a sense is it on the asset and a new buyer has no way around it the, what, it wasn't disclosed who that chinese buyer was who who the off take was with or not it's believed to be a related party to the um Ostroid and the the chinese related parties that have owned the asset and tried to buy the asset that ferb blocked yep. from buying the asset so yeah very unclear what would happen uh, to that off take but i'd be fascinated to find out and he's hoping we find out quite soon mm. yeah do you think do you think gang feng gang feng's relationship with min res plays a part in this whole thing or not yet to be determined in terms given, of off take and getting it through given that you know the way that min res gang feng relationship has traveled in the past couple of months the direction that's sort of been having mm. heading rather i'd be quite surprised to to hear that they're involved 
I'm not sure if you had different thoughts on that, Trav. Is it, yeah. is it damaged? Like, is it damaged or he just said I'm he doesn't not, want to... I'm not sure if it's damaged Mr. or if they Ellison just want to doesn't become, want to go downstream with... Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if it's damaged or they just want to de-China their business. Just de-China, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to step back just a moment, JD, um, because this looks like it's a seriously, like, drama-heavy um, development. It does, and they're hiding the details from us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, the the... The two pager out from Cordamenta, who are the receivers and managers. Can I um, can I say that I like that name? Cordamenta. Cordamenta just sounds cool. <laughs> you know, another one I like? Baron Joey. <laughs> Something about those names I just like. Anyway, continue on with mining news. Uh, so oh, you can call them quarters for short or KM. Um, mm. Yeah, the, the two pager out from, from quarters, they are um, – it's, mate, it's a bloody it's, – it's staggering to read because my inference reading this two pager – is that Quartermentha want to run a sale process. They've had 10 parties, 10 parties reach out to them with interest. They want to run a sale process. They want to maximize the potential value on the table. And it looks like the administrators have done some deal, which mm. it's unclear to me if they have authority to do said deal, um, which is basically, you know, against what the receivers and managers want to do to actually maximize value in this situation. Jada, and you said that word for word last week. That was one of your queries, wasn't it? Why haven't they gone through yep. a, an auction process oh, to realise the, It's the, the elephant value. in the room, right? Yeah, well, it's yeah. the so receivers the, and managers that should run that process. Yeah, and you get the impression and the they want administrators to. and the receivers being at Quartermentha and McGrath-Nickel aren't exactly seeing eye to eye given that it's this has It's explicit been, in the Quartermentha two-pager because the, administ the administrators have taken them to the Supreme Court already. So yeah. they've commenced proceedings um, on, on behalf of the company against the receivers and managers in the Supreme Court of West Australia seeking to restrain the receivers and managers um, and the secured creditor for, from exercising rights in relation to the secured property. So court yeah. meant to want to be able to run a sale process and maximise value. And there was language to the sort of reverse effect, if you like, yeah. from McGrath and Nichols saying, you know, they're trying to push through. It, it's fascinating, right? And who's who's the winner and loser in this situation, right? Because like, there's a lot of vested interests in this process, and um, and we know that there's that previous equity holders of of a leader think that they still have a residual claim available to them um, by virtue of the the rise in kind of asset value over time. <laughs> if if a side deal is done here, like, do those equity holders get get nothing? But in, in on the contrary, if a proper sale process was undertaken, would they have gotten something? Yeah, and there's little doubt that uh, those previous equity holders are fighting for their rights in, in the courts as well. That's little doubt about that. Yeah, cool. Looking to, and it'd be interesting to see, and, and we talked about last. So are we, are we declaring you've won the carton, JD? No, no, it's not done yet. <laughs> yeah, right. I've got to wait till oh, the fat lady I don't sings. think that actually got into the episode last week, but we had a bet that is predicting who, the, um, who this buyer was. Did it not go into the episode for a reason and I shouldn't talk about it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I think JD bet Minrez. I, I bet all, all came Trav bet Albemarle. Oh, we were pl plucking, plucking the straws. It was man. Friday and we were about to get on the piss. But, um, <laughs> yes, but and uh, I, wonder, I wonder if there's any involvement of develop with Minrez, if this is just Minrez by themselves or developer in as a some sort of JV or they will just be looking to take it underground so i'll be uh keeping my eyes on that i'm trying to get myself into your bet <laughs> jd so Rick, 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 i think that's almost like the yeah like that's going to be fascinating to watch this 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 thing too is mate littered with potential litigation all over it like look at how many vested interests are associated with this we, we've we've heard about the people who are funding the lawsuits over like literally several years we've heard like like imagine it imagine a deal where um where only one party was at party was actually you know able to make an offer like that is just so controversial in the context of what we see out there it would be amazing like Im and imagine how many people would be pointing the fingers and wanting to know the details it's it's it, staggeringly in God, interesting you'd pay to, to be me. a fly on the wall in some rooms wouldn't you well I, I just feel like this could could drag out um via litigation because because of the vested interests involved yeah and not just one simple litigation either sounds like there's numerous yeah yeah Right. Guys, another interesting story to talk about. Leo, lithium. Talk about they've pretty much lost a nut today. Uh, they're down 50% Leo yep. lithium. So, so they were they were in suspension for a couple months and we'd been mm. sort of flagging it on an ongoing basis. As a quick reminder, they've got the Gulamina asset in Mali, which is a JV with Gangfang. So one of the headlines is that the government has stopped them 
direct shipping or DSO. We, um, they were, you know, crushing the ore and they were going to truck it out to the to the coast. But that has been stopped by the government. So that's a bit of a, a revenue blow. They were expecting mm. revenue quite soon from that. So the, the mined ore is now being stockpiled and they're expecting to start operations in Q2 of 2024. They also say that the ongoing or the discussions with the government regarding a free carry stake are ongoing. A couple other notes were that the project is 35% constructed with 1,200 people on site, right. which is uh, huge. So we tuned into the investor call that, that happened this morning at nine o'clock. And there's a few highlights that I want to run through with you guys. Firstly, on the DSO being cancelled, the government didn't provide a reason, although Leo did note that it wasn't a part of their initial studies. This was this was the big takeaway, wasn't it? Oh, one of, one of many. There was, there was plenty <laughs> interesting takeaways. There was another that a US $50 million payment for import duties or taxes may be upcoming. There are other changes regarding the mining code. So Mali has been in the press quite a bit lately regarding governments plus the private sector in Mali having up to a 35% stake in projects going forward. So and previously what, it was... Tw- yeah, 10 plus 10, 10 so up 10 to 20. 10 plus 10, up to 20, yeah. What did you make of the commentary on the coal in relation to that that so the, mining code being yeah, applicable so the, to Leo? The Leo management were pretty adamant that the old mining code is what's applicable to them, not the new mining code. So in, in other words, they're being grandfathered. They said there was some in what information the Mali government provided, there was strong wording indicating that it was to purely new projects. So even though theirs is not in production, but it has been in development um, yep. for, for a while now. So Exactly. It wasn't conclusive, but it was very, they were saying, indicating that that, um, yeah, it doesn't sound like there's a skeleton in the closet there, but yet to be, yet to be determined. Who can bloody, who knows? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an overhang, I'd say, still. So there was more um, commentary regarding the ownership structure of the, the Gulamina JV. So the initial sort of 50-50 split with Gangfang has been altered. So once Mali exercises its right for that first 10%, it'll be 40, 50, 10. That's Leo, Gangfang, Mali. Yep. And then ultimately the, the result will be once or if and when the government of Mali comes in for their extra 10%, it'll be 35 Leo, 45 Gangfang and 20% Mali government. So, so, that, so the first 10 JD, the Mali government had, had not had to have paid anything for that, but they will have to pay for the next 10% that that, if they choose to acquire it. That's right. So what the company said around that is that an independent valuer would be brought in followed by negotiation and that it would not be a cash payment for that market value of an extra 10%, but it'd essentially be a loan from the company to the government that the money would come out of future dividends paid out. So, JD, so, so there's never go, there's not going to be any cash boost to Leo Lithium if they do sell that 10% because it's coming out of future earnings. That's right. Okay. Did they? Uh, I'm, I'm sure this would have uh, couldn't have been couldn't have been left out. Always finds its way in there. Five Finch Marilla did that uh, find its way into the investor call, Jada? It Richard sure Knight, did. Richard Knight's asked the question, I think. <laughs> yeah, there was um, there was a couple questions around this one. So what they'd said is that the government has set up a commission to look into what's going, and they asked the company Leo to explain the relationship between Five Finch and Leo. There was a a sort of pointed question around whether they knew if the government of Mali was satisfied with the response that Leo had given. And it was an interesting response. They said, we have exhausted the government lines of inquiry. So unsure whether the Mali government is satisfied that there's no, you know, ongoing relationship between Leo and Firefinch bar the shareholding that Firefinch still maintains in Leo. So five inch shareholders will be even more pissed off now because uh, Leo Lithium has gone down fifty percent, and their escrowed shares are now half the value. Yeah, so let's hope that. But they've got a bit of time. They, they've they got a year to recover. They might be happy that it's actually listed now because yeah, mm. yeah. It's so fifty, possibly fifty percent higher than they could have been. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was one other interesting question that uh, was had sort of done its rounds, uh, making a few rumours over the past couple of months, and that's regarding downstream processing and whether the government of Mali would force Leo to do more downstream processing. And the it was quite a straightforward answer to that one. The guys at Leo said no, there had been no 
uh, requirements that they do anything further downstream in country. So another just final detail that was interesting, whilst the call was sort of happening, the the share price came off another 10%, uh, 10 cents rather from about 66 odd cents whilst the call was going to finishing around 56 or so. It's obviously like price discovery is still happening at the moment. There's a lot of new news um, being brought out to shareholders. So we'll sort of see how that all settles. Mate, it was, the price action was insanely volatile. Mm. I saw As you'd it. expect, it was, right? Yeah, like, like between 58 cents and 72 cents intraday when I was looking at it, which... Yeah, and they were talking yeah. to a presentation that, that we noted hadn't even been released yet. So yeah. All, yeah. all a bit confusing. So there's Would, clearly some risks that still yeah. stand out for the company. So... Like I said at the beginning, the government's free carry interest discussions are still ongoing. So but whether they whether they exercise their new potential right to go up to thirty five percent ownership. Yeah, they, I mean the you? the company seems confident that they are part of the old mining code and that won't happen. But yeah. there's still question marks, and you know you're in Mali that's still sort of subject to change. The Marilla situation, you know, given what I just read out, it's it's not definitively put to bed. We've obviously got the up to 50 million US dollars in payments and that leads to the questions around being fully funded. And then like we'd sort of touched on, just the uncertainty regarding which mining code is applicable. The company obviously admit that the first original mining code is applicable, but I think that overhang is going to exist around the stock for a while to come. I don't think I don't think they'll let me have any dramas finding that 50 million based on the previous um, placement to Gang Feng at a, at a premium of... Oh. from what I remember. It was at a premium, but a lot has changed since then, right? Yeah, that is true. Um, I thought it would be interesting to actually look at comparing a Tier 1 jurisdiction, lithium operation, to one in Mali. And <laughs> why not continue on from our chat about Kathleen Valley? And just I've, I've done this comparison before, but it's um, it just highlights the risk uh, in Mali compared to, I guess, the attractiveness of Australia. But then again, with CapEx blowouts and cost of wages these days, um, Australia probably isn't as attractive as it was. But look, if you look at Kathleen Valley for Town, 156 million tonne resource at 1.4% lithium. Predominantly, uh, it's all effectively underground. So you could say a bit more complex and a bit higher risk. And Albemarle are today offering $6.6 billion to buy that company. You look at Leo Lithium, on the other hand, the Gulamina project has a resource of 211 million tonne at 1.37%. So similar grades, about um, 30% higher in resource. Pretty much a massive bloody open pit currently, and they're currently capped at around 600 million. But let's look at their, let's say, let's assume they will own 35% of that project eventually, if uh, assuming Mali take up their extra 10%, then it's the ratio that you said before and Leo Lithium will have 35%. Even with a, but look, you've got to th- you look at the market caps on a 100% project ownership basis. Back of the envelope, that puts Gulamina being valued at about 25 to 30% of what Kathleen Valley is being valued at. So considerable, mm. considerable difference. Um, and they've got a 30% bigger resource, but heightened government uncertainty in Mali. There's another factor so, there yeah. uh, too, which would lend uh, Lion Town to getting a, 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 a premium valuation. And that's just, um, it's unencumbered from a partner process. So, I mean, Gulamina, you have to accept Gang Fang as your 50-50 JV, yeah. the geopolitical dynamics at the moment. Yeah. Y- you probably command a premium if you're, um, you know, unencumbered aligning with the Chinese party at this mm. stage. Yeah, and then, oh, then, and guess then you'd actually, then you'd put back the potential funding gap of Lion Town as well. You know, it talks about a 300 odd, odd plus million 300 funding is not gap. much in the context of 6.6 billion. Though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's like, if you're looking just on a project basis yeah. of the valuation um, and look though, it's not a like for like because it's open pit underground, but you can, you can't say that automatically say like I automatically think that underground will be a uh, bit more complex and higher cost. So I thought I'd better confirm that before <laughs> I actually say this shit. Um, if you we talked the other week 
there was commentary out of Jardin and what the burn cut tender was valued at for what Lion Town is, and it come out that it's predicting they're going to sit at around a hundred dollars per ton uh, unit operating cost for mining, not including the sustaining capex. Um, if you look, that was $45 a tonne in their original DFS, so it's like, look, it's doubled since then, as we've known in Australia. If you look, if you look at Goulamina's 2021 DFS, so they've got a, it's an all-open pit, strip ratio of 3.26 to 1. If you convert their C1 mining cost of, they report it as US $83 a tonne, uh, $83 per concentrate tonne, uh, if you convert that to Aussie dollars per milled, like they're at a 2.3 million tonne run rate, which is what they are proposing, it equates to $27.80 a tonne for their open pits, their C1 mining costs. So look, even if you doubled that since 2021, it's still sitting about half of the mining cost that Kathleen Valley is. So it does show that how... These are predictions, but it does show that uh, a nice simple three-to-one stripping ratio on an open pit will be much cheaper than installing ground support and pouring paste into holes underground. So The good, the good thing about a mine in WA, mate, you don't have to worry about the government coming in and no, wanting, yeah, wanting geez, more yeah. in the future. I'd pay 50 bucks a tonne for that, <laughs> most definitely. Right, good stuff, boys. What's, well done, God, what's going to bloody... I guess what's next? What are we waiting for? Well, we're, we're obviously waiting for confirmation that the... Marley government's not going to exercise the right to go up to thirty five percent ownership. I I think and even it's before going to be that, grandfathered. The, my my hair, my uh, understanding of the the call was that um, Leo have provided documentation to the government of Marley for them to accept their first ten percent, and they're still waiting to hear back from them. That was given to them last month. Um, they're still waiting waiting for that to be returned to them. So, yeah, the, we could yeah. see potential updates given from the government of Marley to. Firefinch regarding what's going on there, and that might have some um, implications on on Leo as well. Right, boys, and then and then sorry, lastly, oh, just sorry, on those those taxes and and duties, oh, there's the going to fifty gonna, million buck payment. Yeah, there'll be a decision that comes out of the the government of Mali regarding what needs to be paid. Is that fifty million US? Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Right, boys, educate me. Never heard of them. Argosy. This is the fourth big lithium story of the day, Oh, I love, I love saying new stuff. I've got to add yeah, them to me watch list. Obviously, this is on par with being as big as an important a lithium story as Lion Town's bid from Albemarle, Leo Lithium coming back online, Bold Hill going to Minres, right? Are you being sarcastic? 100%. Because <laughs> you, you, so you used that same voice in the Fortescue presentation <laughs> the other day. It's a pretty funny announcement, mate. Um, I can see they're ramping up their Rincon Lithium project. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those small brine um, projects they uh, they quote it as having a nameplate capacity. They often quote this nameplate. Nameplate capacity of the operation is uh, two thousand tons per annum. In the month of August, they produced a whopping ten tons. So if you annualise that, uh, you get one hundred and twenty tons, which is a fair bit short of the two thousand nameplate. Let but, me check that. But yep, that maths is right. <laughs> maybe I'm being a bit harsh, fellas. <laughs> they are ramping up after all. Um, and Hastings is the other one I'm keen to talk about, Maddie. They've got a new CEO. Uh, obviously, they, they had Alwyn Vorster as an interim CEO. He didn't extend his contract beyond um, the, the predetermined period. I think he was there for eight months. Now, now Paul Brown has been appointed CEO, and he's starting in a couple of weeks. He had a bit of um, bit of experience at other parts of the world, didn't he, JD? Yeah, he worked as chief exec at of commodities and chief exec of lithium, both at Minres, and he's also worked at Fortescue before that. So, by background, he's a mining a mining engineer and you know we've we've touched on Hastings in the past he's going to have his work cut out for him they want to construct and get up to speed producing NDPR from their Yangibana I think that's how you say it project up in north of WA so if you want a bit more info on rare earths go back and listen to our conversation that we had last week with Dylan Kelly of Terra Capital it was it was a in-depth long discussion on all things rare earth I learned heaps from it can't recommend it Highly enough, not just because it's a uh, money of mine podcast episode, but I think if you're interested even remotely in investing in rare earths, it's a must listen. You just can't find anything that fucking good anywhere else. That's no. why it's a money of mine podcast, yeah. JB. <laughs> and in that chat, DK, um, I think he, he said something like, yeah, Hast- like we're talking about Hastings Turbulent um, recent history. And he mentioned that you know it had like an EV of about 30 million bucks lately. DK to deduce that 30 million bucks just did a, a simple market cap minus the cash 
Um, but I went to a, a bit more depth um, on, on this number, fellas, and I'm keen, I'm keen to articulate why it's not as simple as that. It's, uh, it's quite unquote not that cheap, right? Um, so it's got $144 million market cap and $102 million cash as at 30th of June. Plus, they own 20% of Neo Performance Materials, which the latest share price is worth about $97 million. So to calculate the EV, market cap minus cash minus those shares, gets you a negative EV of $55 Jeez. million. How does, that, how does that work? Hang on. There's, there's a catch, right? You also need to factor in the fact that part of Hastings' capital structure are these convertible notes with Wailu. So which on my numbers, Wailu's convertible notes would be exchangeable um, for about 40 million uh, Hastings shares over their term, which are currently valued at Hastings' current share price, uh, you know, or at the, at the con- yeah, at once they convert at Hastings' current share price of about $45 million. But given the face value of those con notes at the end of the term would actually be closer to about $215 million. I can't imagine Wailu actually wanting to convert them <laughs> for, for something valued $45 million. Mm. Um, so they just asked for the, they'd ask for the cash, right? Um, so instead of assuming that the convertibles convert, I think you just have to add that $215 million onto your on back onto that EV, treat it as, as a debt instrument, and yep. that gives you a fully diluted EV of about $160 million. Ah, oh, Rick Gardenio. That's bloody impressive, mate. I like that. You just you, you were the horse that got led to the water and you drank a shitload then. <laughs> I see that. That is sensational. <laughs> How does that not make sense, Jada? <laughs> DK, uh-huh. Travis the horse, DK, let him. <laughs> anyway, I'm, it's all I'm all over it, mate. All over it. Good stuff, boys. Beauty. I like that. Yeah, don't don't discredit DK's interview. It was bloody awesome. It was wicked. But Travis pretty awesome too. <laughs> it appears. Right, boys. Good good chat. Yeah, a couple, there's couple a f- sponsors to I think. Hope there's a fuckload more M&A to stories. <laughs> I love M&A. Jesus Christ. Love it. More to come. Right. Our bloody partners, Top Drill at the start of the show, and our great other partners scattered throughout the week. We've got JP Search, K Drill, Anytime Exploration Services, and Terra Capital. Thanks a heap, guys. Great to have beers with the um, with Seamus and Rhino Sullivan the other day. It sure we was. Can, we're doing. Uh, we're going to get a bit of a sponsor day going every now and then. We're going to buy two beers each. For <laughs> yeah. Hooteroo, good guys. Times. Hooteroo. Hooteroo. Do you want me to stop, Jada? The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.